I'm pleased to introduce our next speakers, Daniel Pink, the author of several books, such as To Sell is Human and Drive, who will be interviewing Sendhil Mullenathan, a professor of economics at Harvard. Daniel has authored five books about business, work, and behavior, and has given a TED Talk on the topic of motivation. We asked our speakers to share little known facts about themselves, and Daniel stood out. He said, in college, I ran for student government president, but lost to a candidate whose sole promise was to bring a penguin to campus. I don't know about you guys, but I'm certainly motivated to learn more about that story. I first encountered Sendel's work in my undergraduate studies and was immediately hooked. I would say that his work in behavioral economics is what set me down the path um, that I'm on today. His research has tackled controversial questions through data, such as understanding the impact of poverty on mental bandwidth and uncovering discrimination through fictitious resumes. I'm particularly excited to hear this pair's discussion. They're both very accomplished authors and giants in their field. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Daniel Pink and Mr. Sendhil Mullenathan. Sendhil was um, not born in this country. Sendhil was born in southern India. And he came to the United States when he was seven years old. And like many uh, immigrants, um, particularly immigrants from South Asia and Southeast Asia, uh, he really struggled academically. Um, it took him uh, a full three years to graduate from Cornell with a triple major <laughs> in economics, computer science, and mathematics. Uh, then he went on to get, earn his PhD at Harvard, uh, which some of us, myself included, uh, know, uh, if you're familiar with the institution, it's often known as the Northwestern of the East Coast. Um, <laughs> And then he went on five years after getting his PhD to, be, to win a MacArthur Genius Grant. So Sendel's, he's finding his footing, OK? <laughs> Give him some time. He has some potential. Um, and so what we, wanted, what we want to talk about today is, is the latest turn in Sendel's work. And one of the great things about Sendel as a scholar is just the range of things that he's explored. But he's really turned his attention to a topic called Machine learning. Now, how many people here have heard of machine learning? OK, very good. How many people actually know what machine learning is? How many people know enough that if I were to call on you right now, you could tell me? <laughs> so we're going to start. OK, that guy right there. Uh, we're going we're gonna to start here, because this is, a, this, is, this is a little bit, I think, of a little peer into the future. Yeah. Sort of, uh, the emerging present here. So Sendel, what is machine learning? You know, Dan, before I answer your question, I have to say I'm a little disappointed because after hearing that story, I realized I might not be getting a penguin at the end of this. No, you, you won't be. You said if I no. came, we talked, no. I'd get a penguin. What's going on here? No, no. Machine learning. So <clears throat> let me take a part of machine learning and just talk about that okay. in a little bit of depth. Um, I think one of the canonical problems that we face as uh, Sendo is also the kind of person who uses the word canonical yeah, in the very yeah. first sentence he utters. Yeah. So <laughs> keep going. I'm going to double yeah. down on that word. Yeah. Uh, a problem that we all face since I, I feel like I'm with my editor now, Dan. Yeah. I think like, what he does. Uh, no. So the, um, a problem that we all face all over our lives that without even realizing it is that we make predictions every day for big and small problems, we predict. And almost, some people believe the human brain is a prediction machine, mm. that one of its purposes is to predict and anticipate. And we're actually extremely good at it. At the same time, we're really shitty at it. And I think that the part of machine learning I hope we can focus on today yeah. is a set of tools that have come into being that are extremely powerful at taking data of the form, here's an outcome, here's a bunch of facts about that outcome, and now I'm going to come up with a way to take those things and predict the outcome. So it could be anything from, here's a bunch of people who have committed crimes in the past, and a bunch of people who haven't, which one is going to commit the crime? Mm -hmm. Now that should sound a lot like a regression. Why don't I just run a regression? The thing about machine learning that is truly transformative is, in regressions, we as humans get in the way. Like, I've run lots of regressions, and the way I do it is I decide which variables to put on the right-hand side. That's human curation. Mm -hmm. So something about predictions that we do with regression have inherently human fingerprints very strongly on them. And what I've really been sort of blown away by machine learning is that with that as a tool, where it doesn't have as much curation as, say, I would running a regression, you find an enormous predictive power 
in things that we might not even have realized there is predictive power. So I'll give you one example. Yeah, it's yeah, probably yeah. the most. Need, let's, let's, yeah. let's, 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 let's bring let's this down. Us, yeah, bring it down to um, um, like, how is it used? What does it look like? Yeah, how yeah, does it yeah. like matter in, in yeah. life in general? And then we'll talk about how it matters in HR. Perfect. So I'll give you an example where it's not even that it matters. It's just surprising that this thing can do it. So you take, there were these, I think it's the Baum books. So he wrote these Oz books. He wrote a bunch of them. And at some point he died, and he had a successor who wrote the following books. Oh, okay, uh, L. Frank Baum. Yeah. I thought you said Bond, the Bond books. <laughs> oh, I love those too. Yeah, we'll that's talk about good, them yeah. too. Uh, um, uh, so, I'm sorry, so, so, so L. Frank these, Baum, yeah. right. So he wrote these, and then they're the ones written by a successor. And then there's a last book that was published with his name and his successor's name, okay. because it was what he was working on when he died. So lots of people are curious, well, who wrote what in that book? Now, there are a lot of literary scholars who have spent time on this, by which a lot, I mean 10. Um, and they've tried <laughs> to figure out what, and they debate amongst themselves, because I think that is what academics do. Uh -huh. um, but imagine training an algorithm with sentences from each book and saying, this is a Baum sentence, this is not a Baum sentence. Okay. It turns out that algorithm with great precision can tell you what's a Baum sentence and what's not. And if you graph that for the middle book, you'll see Baum, 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 the other guy. And you can see the chapter at which he stopped writing to that level of precision. And why I'm bringing up that example is because the algorithm is seeing something that we as humans can't see. Right. That is, we're so used to thinking about machine learning applied to these things that I kind of think of as automation. Oh, let's get a self-driving car. But that's like stupid dog tricks. It's mm -hmm. like, okay, the best thing it's going to do is to drive a car kind Sorry, of Sorry, like, Google people. <laughs> yeah. No, but in a way, yeah. the best it's going to do is drive a car the way I drive. And that's, yeah. that's, you know, and maybe better with less, ac I'm a really good, I mean, I'm a really good driver. <laughs> and nobody else is but me. Yeah. But, but the, um, but that's, and that's useful for transforming certain types of tasks. Right. Uh, but what's really intriguing about machine intelligence is it can do things that we can't do. And that to me is the sort of the, the powerful low hanging fruit, the ability to see things in data that we might not have seen. So machine learning, let's just, so machine learning is, uh, you take a set, uh, you take some, some data, some kind of inputs, you shovel it into the algorithms, and then the machine makes predictions, but then the machine, the machine also learns from its predictions. It, it's, it gets better as time goes on. And the more data it gets, the better and better it gets. Right, and so give me, so give us an example of something that it could be, something that, you know, Siri is not machine learning, Siri is actually machine oh, learning. Siri is, is machine kind of learning. Yeah, so like some, an example of a machine learning thing that Siri might, this was a big breakthrough in language. Let's actually take a step back. Artificial intelligence was so exciting in the 60s. Yeah. And we thought we were gonna crack this nut. Like, oh, we're gonna figure out how to get machines like us. I think the big change that happened in the 60s, between the 60s and the 80s, I should even tell it like a personal story. Like when I was a computer science student, people had all of these problems. Like, voice recognition, mm -hmm. uh, how do you even interpret, convert sine waves into language? And there were these, considered these intractable problems. And like one day we'd crack them. And then I'd stop doing computer science for a while, and then I bought my iPhone, and I'm like, how did this intractable problem now sit on my freaking phone? Mm -hmm. What the hell happened? And the view that people had in the 70s and 80s was we would understand how the human mind operated, because we do these things so trivially and program it up. The big change while I was gone was forget trying to get machines to do it like us. Forget introspection. Forget thinking, how do I do this? Let me program it up. Let me turn it into a massive learning problem. And then just give it more and more instances. So you click the button and you say weather. And maybe it didn't know that the first 100,000 times that when people said weather, they wanted the weather. Now, of course, someone hardwired that part. But even if it didn't know that, well then, over time, it'll learn from your reaction to that, which is close that app, go look up the weather, oh, that's what that person wanted. So it's easy when you give enough instances of the right, it's almost like, you remember when we used to train rats, like with like electrical shocks? It's really reinforcement learning at one level. You get the yeses and the noes, and you just keep discriminating. Now what that means is, machines don't think any way like we do. They're not designed that way. So if you took out Siri, you could marvel at it and say, wow, I say weather how much of what I said did it understand? Because it knew to tell me the weather in the city I'm in right now. That's actually a pretty shocking level of understanding. Yeah. Right, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Now, 
really, I want you guys to try this after the session. You can do it now, it's probably a little rude. But take Siri out and say, don't tell me the weather. Guess what it's going to do? It's going to tell you the weather. Somebody try that right now. <laughs> don't do it now, because yeah. if it doesn't work, I no, no. can bear No, no, no. I, I did it yesterday. I don't think the algorithm's catching up with me. Though I do it enough times, maybe it will catch up with me. Um, so in fact, that's why Siri needs to be connected to the cloud. You are providing training instances uh -huh. so that it enters the cloud, so then people are able to. So we can use machine learning for uh, on our phones to get information. We can use it in navigation. Um, let's bring it to what? What does it mean for HR? Does yeah. it mean that we we don't? we no longer have to have human intervention when we hire people. We can just take all of these data from candidates, shovel it in, That's and right. say, I want Fred, Maria, and John. Right, uh, and Jamal. Um, the, the thing I want to make sure, uh, so let's break that down. The nice thing is once you understand that machine intelligence is a pure prediction problem, mm -hmm. then the output of that machine intelligence is only as good as the variable that it's predicting. And the thing about prediction is that it's a ruthless prediction engine. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have any semantic understanding of the variable it's predicting. So it doesn't say, you don't say, oh, here's um, our performance measure. Find us the high performing candidate. It's not finding you the high performing candidate. It is ruthlessly and brutally finding the candidates that do very well by the metric. That, it's like, a, you made fun of uh, us Asians, but it's like an Asian student really learning to the test. Like, but, but brutally. So in that sense, it, 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 you, when you sort of apply a tool like that, the first step I think I would ask myself is, how well does this measure represent exactly what I want? And in the human resources context, we've known for a long time that is absolutely not true. That, that, that rarely happens. We've known this from in the incentive world where there's a beautiful paper, you, you know this paper, the, the, fal the folly of paying for A while hoping for B. There's an equivalent machine learning problem, the folly of predicting A while hoping for B. That's what almost every HR problem is. Our variables are merely proxies. And you may say, I validated it. It correlates at 0.7 with the thing I really want. But guess what? The algorithm is not just picking the 0.7 part. It's brutally picking up the other 0.3 part. So you can kind of end up with these extreme type of situations. So in some sense, I think there's a huge, I'm not being negative. I'm saying that's the downside. Yeah. The upside is, um, what's, I, what's, it, what's machine learning going to allow someone here who's yeah. an HR executive yeah. to do that he or she couldn't do before? Yeah. So I think amongst the things that it's extremely good at is it's extremely good at picking up signal that you and I might not know, uh -huh. and it's not a biased person. So if I was having people uh -huh. screen resumes, one thing we've learned, let's take the case of discrimination. Right. We know that without intending to, people's tendencies, discriminatory tendencies can, can squeak in. What's interesting is that algorithms are not racist. They're neither in, they have no inherent preferences. All they care about is the Y variable that you gave them. Mm -hmm. Now that Y variable could have some sure. built-in rate. But if that's not there, they're not going to bias towards African Americans against Africa. They're just going to look at the, so in some sense, the flip side of, uh, it's useful to think of where machine intelligence is foolish, but where human intelligence is bad is we are limited in our ability to look at large amounts of data and extract signal. We have tons of biases in what we do. We say, this candidate looks like Fred, and Fred was a low performer. We don't want Fred. And you may say, I moved past that, but you haven't moved past that. That's the way your brain works. Your brain works through categories and exemplars, and it's very hard to debias ourselves. So what we have is these sort of two modes of thought, one which is very empirically driven, but narrow, because it only sees what you've given it, mm -hmm. and another mode of thought which is integrative and can see a lot of things, but is biased. And I think the challenge of HR is how do we integrate these two modes of thought, and it's absolutely, to me, I would view it almost not like an either or, but as another voice in the room in making these decisions. Interesting way to put it. Okay, so, so, what, is that, so what is that other voice? The machine is the other voice in the room. What's it adding? And then in the conversation, then what's the human adding? That's right. So that's a great question. So what the machine is adding is it's saying, based on all of the historical examples, these, this is my best guess of what this person's score will be on that variable. Seems like a narrow thing. 
But if what I was thought I was predicting, say I do graduate admissions, mm -hmm. so I do PhD admissions. So what I think I'm predicting is where will the student place when they graduate from the PhD program? This thing is giving me a pretty right. good guess of that number. Right. But of course, as an admissions person, that's not the only number I care about. And so there's a bunch of other concerns I care about, but what this allows me to do is to delude myself from thinking things like, oh yeah, this person is not gonna do, oh no, our best guess is this person really is going to place at this level. And so in some sense, think of, I often think of this as someone gives you a very complex file, whether it's a, a resume or a resume plus a bunch of interview notes or whatever it might be, and that file has a lot of data. If somebody could just collapse that data into one number for you, mm -hmm. that is what a good machine learning algorithm says. Okay. The best guess we have of the variable you told me to guess is this one. Now, is that number determinative by itself? Almost never. But is that a good place to integrate into the rest of the discussion? Usually always. Does that make sense? So it's almost like, it's kind of a summarization of that data. Well, I like the metaphor of the other, another voice in the room. It's not a, repl yeah. it's not a replacement there for that. Go, there but there's go. also implications for machine learning and actually the, the job that people do. So, you, you know, you look at, at lawyers, some aspects yeah. of practice law can be, yeah. be done better with machine learning. Yeah. Some aspects of medical diagnosis can be done better with machine learning. Yeah. Take this out a little further yeah. to its effect on the labor market yeah. and be as dystopian as you can. <laughs> um, uh, I am actually a robot, Dan. I don't know if yeah. you knew that, but uh, I'm version two. You should have seen version yeah. one. Don't tell me the weather. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a little, I saw a graph the other day about routine, cognitively routine jobs yeah. and cognitively non-routine jobs yeah. Yeah. and how cognitively routine jobs are, dis are disappearing, cognitively non-routine jobs are not disappearing. Right. What was so interesting about that, this is germane to your point, is how yeah. they think about routine. Mm -hmm. It's very much a view of computing, which is automation. Anything that you have to do repeatedly right. is a automatizable right. job. Right. Um, automatable job. And, uh, but anything that you don't is not automatable. I think right. that's probably been the big change. There are a bunch of things that machines can do that are not, quote, routine anymore. Right. So you pick the example of diagnosis. Yeah. Think of a radiologist. What do they do? So you, you've done your MRI. Take the MRI, they look at it and say, oh, look, you've got a little tumor yeah. here, but given its shape, I think it's not malignant, blah, blah. Right. Now, what would you rather have doing that? That, that activity is exactly a prediction problem. Mm -hmm. We have tons of MRIs. We know who died. Do I want, I want a machine to do that? that do like I want any problem. human judgment in there? I think let's talk about in terms of predicting whether the thing is malignant. Probably not. In terms of predicting what course of action we therefore take requires tons of human judgment. Right. Uh -huh. Do we operate? Well, that depends on a variety of things, including your preferences, including exactly. how afraid you are. Right, exactly. So in some sense, predictions are usually only a fraction of the things that go into a decision. Right. But, they're a but, the, but, if, but if you have this ability to, to predict, exactly. so then that becomes a powerful tool, and it actually does displace some of the functions of exactly. white-collar professionals. That's very whether well Whether it's put. doctors or whether it is lawyers saying, what's this judge going to do yep. when, he, when she faces this decision? That's right. And you can pop that in there, and so, so if you think about machine learning, it's basically a, a super powerful, awesome predictor. Right, but that is very data hungry. Uh -huh. So the MRI example is the one where you're pretty sure we're not gonna be having doctors just reading the MRI anymore. Right. Why, because we have, sadly, millions of instances of cancer being generated every year. Right. So in some sense, the places where human prediction will remain are where there's idiosyncratic prediction. Mm -hmm. You know, predicting the election Mm -hmm. That's actually That's not a good machine learning task mm -hmm. because there aren't enough elections for the machine to learn from. Right. There's, you need hundreds of thousands of data points. Right. Predicting what is the problem with your knee based on all the symptoms you show. Yeah. That's a machine learning task. So you, I like your way of putting it in terms of functions. There are definitely functions of some important, very high cognition jobs mm -hmm. where people are paid a lot of money. Does it start climbing the ladder of cognition, though? Mm. Does it start picking up other kinds of things? What if we have an algorithm that can predict whether someone like you is likely to be scared of going into surgery? What right. if we know from your family makeup right. that... Right. So, does it, so I, yeah. I really want to push this a little bit, yeah. because there's, cause out there in, the, in, the, in the, kind of the conversation now is this idea of the singularity, when machines basically become smarter than human beings. Yeah. Yeah. 
Please discuss. <laughs> I have a 30 second answer, yeah. but we only have 15 seconds left, so I think I'll, no, no. Um, no, but but it, yeah, but no, it's it a is great but it is out there. I mean, yeah. I mean, there are there are there is a there's a there's a view out there. It's it's more West Coast than East Coast. That, um, that you know, I mean, that, that's not a joke. I mean that seriously. That that there, that we're going to get to a point, perhaps within our lifetimes, where machines begin to become actually smarter and perhaps more capable than than yeah. we are. And then, if you really want to push this out to, to more to the sci-fi frontier, machines begin to develop something close to a consciousness. Let's, let's not go there, yeah. but let's go, to the, let's go to this idea of yeah. the, let's go to the idea of the, the singularity, when, when uh, uh, machine learning can be a better doctor. Yeah. Machine, a machine can be a better, not just a better, machine can be not just a better calculator, yeah. but can be a better financial advisor. Machine yeah. can be a better doctor. Machine can be a better lawyer. Machine conceivably could be a better teacher. And we get to the point where yeah. Yeah. we're just sitting here. There's, a, there's one graph that'll take me maybe about a, a minute to explain, but it is like, it, I think of it as the one graph I wish everyone would know about machine learning. Okay, great. It is a trivial problem. It's called word sense disambiguation. I give you a sentence, and in that sentence, either we should put, um, either the, say the word weather uh, is, go, is playing a role of weather, W-E-A-T-H-E-R, mm -hmm. or weather, W-H-E-T-H-E-R. Okay. There, you know, so there's lots of this disambiguation that we do from sounds, or you can even take the word bank, which is always B-A-N-K, and you can say, in this sentence, is it river bank okay. or financial bank? Okay. I went to the bank. Right. As humans, we disambiguate very well. We know, you don't stop people and say, wait, do you mean river bank? Right. Or, <laughs> and um, uh, it's, it's a canonical thing. Um, <laughs> The, yeah. <laughs> uh, w this paper is brilliant because it turns that into just the simplest learning problem. It's a machine learning problem. Uh -huh. Predict which sense of the word bank is in this sentence. Right. And you can take all of, say, um, the, the corpus of Google Books okay. and create a billion training instances, okay. 10 billion training instances, and you can graph how well does the algorithm do. Okay. And you can think of different algorithms, but let's take the best one we okay. found. And it just keeps doing better and better when it goes from 10 million to 100 million to okay. a billion. Think of what that tells you. Even at a billion instances, it can't do this perfectly. Right. And here's the shocking thing. When you look at that figure and you say, where does an eight-year-old child fall? Uh -huh. It's at near perfect, having only seen what? 5,000, 10,000 instances? There is something striking about the human brain that we are nowhere near replicating, nowhere near, at least not through this playbook of machine learning we have right now, which is the general purpose intelligence of the ability to learn a lot from a tiny amount of data. And so if I were to put a graph where I say, how data rich is this prediction? After a certain threshold, the machine will trump you. But when there's less than a certain amount of data, you will trump the machine. Mm -hmm. We are amazing creatures that are learning from very small numbers of instances. Right. We are nowhere near the creatures that machines are from large. So why I'm saying that is if you look at the world and you ask yourself the type of tasks I'm engaged in, some of them really are going to get automated out. They mm -hmm. really are the ability to learn from large numbers of instances. Yeah. Give but, us some examples of what, what would be in that category. So I think medical diagnosis, uh -huh. a big fraction of things that fall in that, that mm -hmm. uh, have, that kind of, uh, have that kind of structure. I think if you look at some of the things that fall under human judgment, so um, a judge yeah. deciding whether this person who comes up in front of the judge for bail is going to be committing a crime when they go home, or sh therefore should I lock them up or should I release them? That's prediction. That's just prediction. Um, uh, let's pick another domain, uh, finance. Mm -hmm. In finance, some of the intuitions people used to have were all around, I think, this, this kind of stock, blah, blah. And well, what have we seen? Even simple econometrics started to get rid of people who did technical analysis of oh, this type of stock that goes up and down, et cetera. But that was because we saw early stages of prediction being overlaid. What's difficult, though, is that those big end problems are almost always coupled with small end problems. And that's the part that's very, very hard to kind of overturn. So let me explain what I mean by small end problem. One thing that inherently ch uh, creates small sample size mm -hmm. is that the world is constantly changing. So even the judge who's sitting there making a bail decision, well, they shouldn't be in the, in the sole business of taking all of the previous instances and putting into play. But you know what? They may know, oh, 
this quarter we're having a big problem with gangs in Chicago. Mm -hmm. So this person who came in front of us is actually part of a gang. That's a this quarter thing. Mm -hmm. The algorithm doesn't have enough training instances for that. Right. So in some sense, there's so much of what we do as humans that involves a small N element, if nothing else than the fact that the world is different today than tomorrow. So I'll give you a great example. Like um, you put up, you have, a, you have a, an ad engine that starts putting up ads. And um, you could imagine that certain times you wouldn't want to put up ads for fireworks, for example, if there had just been some bombings. Right. You probably don't want to be displaying ads for fireworks. Now, it's not like we have so many instances of bombings. Right. So you still need someone in there making that small end judgment to fine tune right. it. And those aren't, those aren't minute exceptions. They can be the exceptions that tank the entire enterprise because those are the ones that can cause a huge amount of tail risk and a tail, tail set of problems. So in some sense, if I look to the distant future, I think what we'll have is a world where a lot of the things that are uniquely human judgments are things where I don't know what the miracle, the miracle of it is still the miracle of intelligence. Yeah. It's human still the intelligence. human intelligence. Right. It's still, how can it be that a baby by age eight. It's incredible. Here's the strangest thing. Imagine you found yourself on, a, on an island. They speak a totally different language. Mm -hmm. And it's so different than yours. Mm -hmm. You can try to learn it. How will you ever communicate with these people? Think of how crazy it is that we all have a way to communicate perfectly with each other. Take a child, start talking to that child at age two. By age seven, you will have a perfect translator, a perfect translator between these things that captures semantics, irony, captures everything. We, and, and with very few training instances. If you count it up how often you talk mm -hmm. to a child, not that much. So we have these inherent, incredible intelligence that we, we have not been able to, able to unpack. And that- So you're skeptical about the singularity? No, no I'm, I, I think it's, a, to me, it's something amazing is gonna happen, uh -huh. but it's not the amazing that people, put. I'll tell you a great experiment. So about, this is about 20 years ago. This is an HR experiment, but it's, it's a weird HR experiment. They put people in front of a computer, and they, and they did a task, and the computer helped them and gave them hints for doing this task. At the end, they were asked, how helpful was this computer program? Mm -hmm. Half the people were asked that question as part of a computer survey on the computer that just helped them. Half the people were asked on another computer. Now, <laughs> HR practice says, I shouldn't ask you, hey, was that a good interview? Someone else should ask you. Yeah. But this is a computer. Yeah. But they found the exact same effect. People wouldn't tell the computer, oh, you did badly. <laughs> but that is, it's, it's both hilarious and deeply true of right. a bias that each of us has about right. machine intelligence. Yeah. It's the anthropomorphic bias. We see this, intel this machine being intelligent. Yeah. We think it thinks like us. Yeah. And because we think it thinks like us, we put it to tasks like us. We assume it's doing, but nothing like that. Yeah. So when I look to the singularity, it's not a substitution of us. Yeah, I see what you're, yeah. It's like all of a sudden, this alien creatures of superb intelligence that's very different than our intelligence have right. landed on this planet, and now we have the ability to, with them, do a bunch of activities we never dreamed of. Right. And that, right. to me, is sort of the, it's not a singularity, it's almost like, what, use the word, bionic. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, it's sort of like a, bio, a, sort of a bio, bionic future where it's, you sort of, machine intelligence supplements human intelligence and, and, um, and vice versa. But I love this idea of the anthropomorphic bias because it, it reminds me of, um, uh, there is some data out there on, on um, it, when a machine makes a mistake, you don't trust it. But when a human, like you see that, I see that on my own GPS. Yeah. So on my Jeep, I drive a, I drive a, a, a Prius because. You don't need to brag, Dan. It's every, okay. We, we're no, a it's good actually, guy. it's we'll actually, it. it's actually required in my neighborhood that you own <laughs> one. Um, they, all, many of them come pre-installed with a little NPR decal. And, um, <laughs> and um, so you drive, a, you drive, a, you, you drive along. I'm driving along and like Siri, not Siri, the, the GPS sends me the wrong way. And I'm like, I'm never trusting her again. <laughs> you know, whereas my wife gives me a wrong direction. Oh, you know, it's just a small, it's just a small mistake. There. So the key, so the key takeaway. Give us one key takeaway for um, um, uh, HR people on machine learning. One so, key takeaway. So and I'd then say we'll the key up. takeaway yeah. is the machine can definitely get it wrong, like the GPS. Yeah. But you should be very precise and articulate why you think it's wrong and you're right. And very often, when you think you go to override the machine, you're overriding it for the wrong reason, and, it's, and it is actually right. Mm. So for example, if you override it saying, oh, in my experience, people like this do badly, odds are your experience is a bias sample. 
But if you override it for saying, actually, we, this is the kind of candidate that looks well on the performance measure, but does poorly on the things we actually care about. They're not a good team player. Mm -hmm. That's the right reason to override it. But understand why you're overriding, because override is essential, but our, intu our intuitions about override can be very wrong. Right, so listen to that other voice in the room, right. take it seriously, it's not determinative, and sort of be bionic That's human right. resources professionals. Give it up for Sendel. Thank you.